Well, I'm going to start today with a little time of confession. You know, spiritual confession is one of our disciplines for the summer, so I thought it would be appropriate to spend a little time this morning. So I'm going to ask you to confess something today. How many of you have a Facebook account? Go ahead, you can confess. Just, just confess, get it out there. It's good to get it out there. Did you know that, some of you are relieved that that's what I asked, right? <laughs> Did you know that Facebook now claims to have almost 3 billion users worldwide? 3 billion. Almost 2 billion of us log in every day on Facebook. There are three, uh, excuse me, five new Facebook profiles added every second somewhere in the world. 300 million photos posted every day on Facebook. Now I know some of you younger people no longer do the Facebook thing. You know, it's just not cool. You do the cool stuff like Instagram or WhatsApp. But you know, Facebook owns those too. So, plus I have both of them, so how really, how cool could it be? You know, so. <laughs> Another question, how many of you have a love-hate relationship with Facebook? You know what I'm talking about? Well, half the time when I open it up, I just want to shut it down and never look at it again. And the other half of the time, I kind of like it because I keep in touch with family and friends. But there's one feature of Facebook I, I really have kind of enjoyed because it's kind of unpredictable and exciting. It's called On This Day. You know what I'm talking about? So I open up Facebook, and an image pops up immediately, and it says, On This Day, you know, two years ago or six years ago or nine years ago, you were with your son at a Cubs game. I know, total dad selfie, cut off half the face, you know. <laughs> or you were with your wife somewhere. I'm glad, well, one of us is photogenic. Um, both of those popped up this week, by the way, when I was planning this whole thing. But Facebook reminds you, you were with this person or at that place. It helps you remember. And speaking of memory, did you know that scientists now believe that human memory begins in the womb? That just 20 weeks after conception, a baby brain can remember. I have no idea how they know that. I'm kind of glad I can't remember, you know, but that's what they say. They also believe now that the capacity of your brain to remember stuff is virtually limitless. The brain is so amazing, your memory is virtually limitless. So I was thinking about that. If that's true, then why do I forget to pick up milk on the way home? Well, that's because uh, of something called short-term memory and long-term memory. Some of you have studied this. Short-term memory lasts about 20 to 30 seconds, and that's very discouraging for a preacher. Long-term memory, on the other hand, lasts about, lasts, can last for a lifetime, and that's very encouraging for a preacher. The process of moving something from short-term memory to long-term memory is an incredibly complex thing, uh, but basically it has to do with retrieving and rehearsing the memory and then attaching it to something uh, outside yourself, something concrete, like something visual, auditory, or even olfactory, something you smell, which is why a song on the radio can immediately cause you to remember, you know, something from high school prom. Or can a smell of fresh baked pizza can immediately make you remember something. It's powerful. So Facebook is hel helping me remember events and people fr in my life through images. Now that's what we're going to talk about today. Not Facebook, but but remembering. We're in a summer-long series called The Disciplines of Grace, and week by week we've been talking about building healthy spiritual habits into our lives, like gratitude or generosity or listening. Or last week, Andrew talked about seeking. If you didn't hear his message, go online, listen. Very, very good. Today we talk about the discipline of remembering. Now, that may seem to sound a little bit odd for a spiritual discipline, but remembering actually plays a big role in the entire story of the Bible. For example, the book of Exodus, which tells the story of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt. Um, is hap they, they, they escape Egypt. They go through the sea. Uh, they wander around the desert for 40 years. They finally come to the edge of the promised land. The story shifts then to the book of Joshua. And in between them and the land that God has promised them, the, the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, there stands a river as a barrier. It's the Jordan River. And the Bible tells us that at that point in time, the Jordan River was at flood stage, meaning it was up to a half a mile wide, deeper than usual, and the water flowing very rapidly. And then God tells his people to do this weird thing. He says, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant, the holiest thing in their possession, the most viable, viable thing they had, and I want you to go stand in the river with it. Just walk out into the river. Now we read these stories, or hear them, and we hear them sort of like Bible stories. 
You know, we don't really pay attention to the, what's happening. Well, this story, these are, these are desert-dwelling nomadic people. That none of them had swim lessons at the YMCA when they were kids. And God tells them to take the most, most valuable thing you have and go walk into the river with it, and the river's at flood stage. And they do it. They obey him, they do it, and God stops the river up, they walk through on dry ground. That's part of the story. And then, right after that happens, God tells them to do something even just as surprising. We pick up the story in Joshua chapter 4. Let me read this to you. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, who's now leading the people, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Then down in verse 24, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always remember to fear the Lord your God. So they cross the river finally and they enter the promised land. And the first thing God tells them to do is not go build your homes, not go plant your fields, but go back into the middle of the river and pick up 12 stones and make a big pile. Why? would he do that? Why would he tell them to do that? Well, to help them remember. He wants them to remember three things. This is what we're going to cover today. To remember who he is, what he's done, and to remember who they are first. We are to remember who God is. As a boy, I grew up uh, believing uh, my father was the strongest person in the world. You may have had that notion yourself, but my father was the strongest person in the world. Um, My brother and I believe that uh, because when we wrestled around with them uh, on the, on the, in the, in the, dining, in the uh, family room floor, we could feel his weight. We could feel his strength. We didn't know any other dad's weight and strength, but we knew his. When he threw a football in the yard, he could throw it farther than the end of the yard. So we thought our dad could do anything. One night, I remember we were going to bed in our bunk beds in our, our little bedroom, and uh, my dad, it was his turn that night, so we got through with the ritual, and then he went to leave the room, Turn off our light, but the hall light was still on in the hallway behind him. And he turned around for a second, and in that moment, he was silhouetted in the door frame with the light behind him. And he was wearing his, his suit pants from the day at work, but he had taken off his dress shirt already, so he just had a white T-shirt on. The white T-shirt, suit pants. And in that moment, his, he seemed to fill the entire frame of the door, silhouetted. And he just turned around and said, night, guys. Walked out, turned off the light. My brother and I, my brother in the top bunk, me in the bottom, we just laid there in silence for several moments. And then my younger brother said in this really quiet, reverent voice, he said, hey, did you see that? And I said, yeah, he's huge. (laughs) Now looking back, I know that it wasn't because his physical size was an ordinary sized guy, maybe 5'10", 180 pounds, just ordinary. But he was huge to us because of the place he had in our lives. His presence, his love, his protection, all that made him huge to us. Joshua says, in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? And by the way, let me really encourage you, if you're a parent, about the Parenting Summit. Because whether your kids are 5 or 15 or 25 or older, they're going to ask, what do these stones mean? What's it all about? Who is God? How do I know? What's my life about? We want you to be prepared. Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. So the 12 stones are to remind them that God is huge. He says... That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord is powerful. Now that phrase, the hand of the Lord, or sometimes the arm of the Lord, is used throughout the Old Testament to point to the power, authority of God. In creation, for example, 
In Isaiah chapter 48, God is, himself says, My own hand has laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand has spread out the heavens. The hand of the Lord brings judgment against evil. In 1 Samuel 5, it says, The hand of the Lord is heavy against his enemies. The hand of the Lord protects and delivers. Here the stones are to remind the people that by God's power they were delivered from the Egyptians. By God's power he provided food in the desert. By God's power he went before them in the pillar of fire. By God's power they crossed the Jordan on dry ground. The stones are to help them remember who God is. His power and authority. But the second thing they ought to remember is that because of his power and authority, he is also to be feared or worshipped. That you may always fear the Lord your God. Now the phrase fear of the Lord just simply means to come before God with awe and reverence. I don't know if you saw this news story this week. Uh, it was another story of a shooting. Six police officers were shot in Philadelphia. They all survived, which is really good. And, but at, at the press conference that day, one of the police officials was giving a, uh, a little uh, update, and he said, quote, uh, somebody upstairs was watching over those cops today. Somebody upstairs. And I, now I know what he meant. I know that's what, how people talk in, in the public forum. But whenever I hear somebody talk like that, you know, somebody upstairs was a big guy, I wonder... Are they talking about the same God I'm talking about? Do they know who it is they're referring to that way? A writer named Annie Dillard has written, Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? It's madness to wear straw or velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews or chairs. Question, why would they need a pile of stones to remember who God is? I mean, this is God we're talking about. The Almighty One, maker of heaven and earth, almighty in power, infinite in knowledge. How could they possibly forget who God is? Remember the story? The, people of, the Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt for like 400 years. God sends Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Then he sends the ten plagues, including the angel of death, from which we get the Passover story. God parts the sea. They cross on dry ground. That's the exodus, the miraculous deliverance of God's people. And within a month, they're complaining. You know the story? Within a month, they go to Moses. Why'd you bring us out here in the desert to die? We'd be better off back in Egypt. At least we have food. We shake our heads. How, how could they so quickly forget but the truth is, we can do the same thing, I think. How do we forget? Well, sometimes I forget who God is when I'm, when I'm uncomfortable for some reason. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I took a trip to Africa and Turkey this pa the, uh, last month. And in Africa, saw people uh, who were living and even in their churches worshiping and little Buildings, if you could call them that, made literally of mud and sticks, eking out an existence. I come back here to our country, and the air conditioning in my car wasn't working properly. And I'm like, oh, God, how could you forgive me? Why have you abandoned me? Or maybe it's something a little more serious for you. Maybe, maybe there's an illness or a loss or a pain. And, and we forget the power, authority, presence of God. But here's the really annoying and ironic thing. I'm also capable of forgetting God when I'm comfortable. A beautiful afternoon sitting on my porch, my little rock, wicker rocking chair, grass is green. It's not right now, but when it will be green. Thinking about, you know, the kids are basically healthy. My wife's happy. There's money in the bank. And instead of breathing a prayer of gratitude, I can find myself thinking, you know, I've done pretty good at this thing called life. And I sort of take credit. You know, God actually warns us about that in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. And you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt 
out of the land of slavery. And I think he says the same thing to us today. You living in the Fox Valley, in the land of plenty, you have built your fine houses and have more than enough to eat. Be careful. Do not forget the Lord your God. Remember who he is. Second thing is we are to remember what God has done. What God has done. Some of you here today know part of this story, or maybe you were here during this story, but we, as a church, purchased the land we are on right now uh, in about between 1999 and 2000. We built the first phase of what became this campus in 2004, but we didn't finish the steeple tower until 2005, fall of 2005. And at some point, shortly after that tower was finished, uh, the man whose company was contracted to build the tower uh, belonged to our church at that time. His name was Dick Porter. He showed up at my office with a gift. What he brought was one of the bricks used in the steeple tower, um, and it had a little plaque on it that says, Pastor Coffee, steeple completion, October 2005. One of, the, one, of the, one of the most meaningful gifts someone ever gave me. And I kept it in my office every day from that day to this day because it reminded me of what God had done. And it reminded me what God is able to do through his church and through his people. That's what's being talked about here. Joshua says, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the stones were to remind them of God's deliverance, of his salvation. Here's a question. How often do you remember when and how God saved you? When Jesus first touched your heart with his truth and his grace. How can you remember that story? If you're married, does your husband or wife know your story, your faith story? If you're a parent, do your kids know your faith story? Do your friends at work, do your friends at school, if you're a student, do they know your story? Can you tell it in a paragraph, in a couple of sentences? Here's how Peter talks about what God has done. 2 Peter 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That's that's the beginning of faith. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And down in verse 12, notice the words I've put in red. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Remember what? I think Peter's talking about two great truths. First, to remember God's provision in Christ. That God provides new hearts and new hope through the forgiveness of sin that Jesus purchased on the cross. That's the core of the gospel that we celebrate. Interestingly, when we remember the cross, we can forget our past and our sin. Did you know that? That's why the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to yet taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We can forget because God has forgotten. Did you know that? In Isaiah chapter 43, God himself says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. You know, sometimes I think we get this completely backwards. Sometimes we spend lots of our emotional and spiritual energy remembering our failures, remembering our past, being reminded of our shame. And we forget what he has already done for us, given us his grace. That's gone for him. Gone. Gone blotted out, nailed to the cross. When we remember, we can forget. That's why, by the way, Jesus gave us these two tangible symbols, communion and baptism, by which we can remember what God has done. Secondly, we are to remember the promises we have in Christ. He says, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. What are those promises? First, the promise of new destiny. 
That is the promise of eternal life, living and ruling and serving with Jesus in the new heaven and the earth. Now, we talk about this promise at Christian funerals. We talk about it standing by gravesides. But it's a promise we can have and hold on to every day of our lives. We're destined for eternity with God. We also have the promise of new identity. The gospel says we've been adopted as sons and daughters of God himself, co-heirs with Christ. That is, his inheritance has become our inheritance. That leads me to the third point I want to talk about. We are to remember who we are. Remember who God is, remember what he's done, and remember who we are. So those 12 stones they piled up were to be like, a, like an ancient on this day from Facebook. A reminder of who God is, of what he's done, and who we are. Again, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, As you come to him, the living stone, that's Jesus, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, and you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. Then in verse 9, listen to all the words that are about identity here. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's your story. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. That whole passage is about who we are. It's about identity. A lot of talk about identity in our world today. It's one of the most common themes in social media and people who, who talk about these things. Identity is simple. It's simply what you think about yourself, what you know to be true about yourself. I've said here often, one of the things my own parents did very, very well when I was growing up was they consistently reminded me who I was, who I am. Not just that I'm their son, not just that I'm the oldest of three brothers, but, and I say this this way on purpose, I didn't live a single day of my life that I didn't, I didn't, when I did not know I belonged to God, that Jesus knew me, that he loved me, and he had a plan to use my life in his great purpose in the world. My parents gave me and anchored my identity and who God says I am. God tells Joshua to set up 12 stones so that when their children ask, notice, when their children ask, what do those stones mean? They could be reminded of who they were, the people of God. So here's what Peter says about who we are. Did you notice? You are living stones being built into a spiritual house. You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. These are talking about the church, what we are right here today, that through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, God has created a new community in the world, a community of people bound together not by their nationality, not by their language, not by their race, not by their social class, but by the power of the gospel to be the body of Christ in the world. That's who we are. And then he said, I wonder if you noticed it, he said, you are God's special possession. You are God's special possession. Did you hear that? That means you and me who often forget who he is. It means you who sometimes live as if you don't even know him. It means you who have felt that your, your sin or your failures of the past have somehow disqualified you from his inheritance, have disqualified you from his grace. It means even you, you are his special possession. It's who you are. One of our family's favorite movies of all time is The Lion King. Lion King first came out in, anybody know the year? 1994, the animated version. Well, this past summer, a brand new version came out, right? A new version that's, that's uh, they use technology to make the animals look like real animals. But, you know, it's the same story. It tells the story of Mufasa, the great king of Pride Rock, and his young son Simba, who is destined to be the future king. Mufasa is grooming his son to one day replace him as king. But Mufasa, unfortunately, is killed by a wildebeest stampede that was initiated by his jealous brother, Scar. And if that's a spoiler alert for you, sorry, the movie came out 25 years ago. You should have seen it by now. <laughs> Scar convinces young Simba that it was all his fault. So he runs away. He runs away filled with shame and fear, and he hides. Sometime later in the story, Simba has a vision of his father, Mufasa, who speaks to him from the sky. 
And he says to his son, I love this line because it, it comes straight out of the Bible. He says, Simba. I can't do that voice, Simba. He says, remember who you are. Remember who you are. You were born for something better than this. You were destined for something greater than this. Remember who you are. And through this ancient story and in his word, God says the same thing to us. He says, remember, remember who I am. Remember what I have done by my strong hand. And remember who you are. You are destined for something greater than this. Each week we've been giving you a little challenge or something to think about in your own spiritual life. And this, this week I'm going to propose sort of a little project. What I want you to think about doing is creating your own personal spiritual memory stone. That as you think back over your life, maybe the last month, maybe the last year, maybe think back across decades and find something that illustrates physically, tangibly, what God's done in your life. Might be a stone, literal stone. Might be a brick. Might be a flower. Uh, might be a photograph. Might be a jar of peanut butter. I don't know. But through it, you could tell your story. And then once you find, have that thing, put it somewhere visible, public. Put it on your kitchen table for a while, if it fits. Put it on your desk at work. Uh, if you're a student, put it in your locker. Again, if it fits. To remind you, but secondly, when someone sees it and goes, hey, wait, what's the story with that? Tell them the story. Tell them the great story of God's strong hand in your life. And tell him who he tells you you are. That's the gospel. Will you close with me in prayer? Lord, I thank you for this reminder to remember. So often we remember the things that are least important and we forget the things that are most important. Help us to remember who you are. Help us to remember what you have done, where we've seen your hand at work. And help us to remember who we are, who you say we are, that by your grace, we belong to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.